everybody. Welcome back to Friday Sews. My name's Kristen. Today on the Dahlia Society, we have a special get to know Friday Sews hashtag. It's very windy out here, as you can tell, but I'm gonna get through these questions so you can get to know a bit more about me and maybe jump on that hashtag and get to know a bit more about your fellow Friday Sews YouTubers. I've got the questions ready, the glasses on, but actually before I get started on that, I wanted to show you We've already seen this top. This is a brand new pattern release from Pattern Emporium called the Time Out Tank. Now I wanted to show you, this is the correct version. I actually made a couple of versions up that I showed on my pattern release. It had a bit of a wider strap. If you're like me and you go into autopilot when you sew a new pattern and you maybe don't thoroughly read through every instruction, you may notice that the true pattern has got a little bit thinner strap than the one I actually previously showed. Now this is the proper correct version that you'll see on the pattern envelope. The ones I made had a slightly wider strap, still the same style. And you also do have the option to hack things however you want when you do have a new pattern. I've also got another one in the process that I'm hacking into a swing version. Hey, who is the owner of Pattern Emporium actually contacted me the other night and she said, hey, check your, check your, your shoulder width because it looks a little bit wider than what it should be. And sure enough, it was the bind way I'd done the binding wasn't totally accurate to the way the pattern instructions had said. She actually sent me a wonderful little uh, tutorial that she'd done for her testers and showed me exactly how she did the binding. And yeah, it was amazing. I'd never done that technique before with the basting stitch and the uh, zig, the lightning stitch. When you fold it over and overlap it like a binding, it gives a little bit more of a tighter, neat finish around the shoulder. So I'll show you up close. This is in a really a more, um, structured kind of knit it's not like a ponty it's more of a like a scuba weight it's actually crepe from spotlight now you may remember a dress i made from this fabric a few months back uh, but i had some leftover fabric so that's the beauty of the time out tank is all of your scraps well it only takes 90 centimeters of fabric to use so it's still on sale i do have an affiliate link uh in the description box below if you want to take advantage of that special price and as is with all the other things i mentioned in that pattern release video those patterns as well are also discounted at the moment. So the old glasses are going on because when you're like me and you scribble down questions and you can't really understand your own writing, yeah, the glasses, the glasses need to go on, definitely. Uh, well, first question is fairly easy. That's what's your name? So my name is Kristen with a K. Uh, it's an E-N, not an I-N, but my whole life I have actually had Christine, Kirsten, Kirsty. Uh, anything but Kristen. I think whenever I go to say my name and someone goes to write it down, they always put the CH. So I've just gotten used to that over the years. I think people, um, yeah, people just assume it's Christine when you go to sort of Kirsten. There are a few of my relatives that called me Chrissy as a child that still do call me Chrissy. So that's and it's a kind of an affectionate name. Um, but yeah, my surname is Camerano and that is my husband is actually half Italian half Polish heritage. So that's where the Italian surname comes from. Uh, he doesn't speak much of either language because I think at home they were very, um, sort of both languages are spoken here and there, mainly English at home. But my parents are actually born in Australia. Uh, their parents were born in Australia, but my ancestry goes back to uh, Irish, Scottish and English. Yeah, so that's me. Uh, I'm 48 years old, so turning 49 this year. And I'm a mum, I've got five kids, all very grown up now. The uh, oldest is 24, got twins that are 22. The only son is 15 and the daughter, the youngest daughter is 13. So yeah, so they've kept me very, very busy. Uh, I think after the first, the first one, we thought we'll go back and have number two and it just ended up being number three, two and three. We got them all to school and went back and had two more because as you do, the house was just way too quiet. But now they're all teens and young adults. I just think, what was I thinking? I could have had a lovely, peaceful house, but wouldn't change it for the world. This question is, where am I from? Well, I'm from down under here in Australia. I am from Melbourne. Now, you guys might know there's a big rivalry between Melbourne and Sydney. The rivalry's always been there. A lot of people think of Australia, they think straight away of the Sydney Opera House in Sydney, but Melbourne is where it's at. We have got a fantastic, multicultural, very diverse city here that we are well known for our sporting, for our theatre, for live music events, for a huge uh, restaurant um, industry. We have some fantastic restaurants here and coffee. I think Melbourne is very well known for coffee. We love our coffee. My hubby is actually a train driver. He actually does metro trains. So we live a little bit out from the city, fair way out from the city, but he runs metro trains in the city. 
Um, and we're just commenting about what a weird year it was last year because Melbourne's very well known for the laneway culture, some really great little cafes. Uh, and last year with the lockdown, it was a bizarre time. He actually got to see a lot of the city that was in just total shutdown. And to, to not see a soul walking around these normally very busy streets was really unusual. Um, but yeah, it's just so nice to be uh, having our freedom back at the moment. We're very, very lucky to be uh, still at zero cases here. So doing okay. Um, yeah, so Melbourne, as you may know, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic place to live. We actually live about 70 kilometres out of the city. So a good hour and maybe hour and a quarter drive. There is not a lot of public transport around where we are. Um, there's, as my daughters have found out, traveling to the city for the university uh, most days of the week. Um, the, we don't have a train out here. We have bus services, but we need to take a bus a good 20 minute drive to get to a train station. So that can be a bit challenging, but we, are, we love where we live. We are live uh, on a very, very small town, country town that is about two kilometers from a beach. Now, when I say beach, it is mainly mud and crabs, but lovely to walk the dog, just don't want to swim there. Um, so you need to drive about another extra half an hour up the road and you'll find the most pristine, beautiful beaches of Phillip Island, places like uh, Kilcundra and Wonthaggy and some gorgeous surf beaches and some beautiful little um, beaches around the bay. So yeah, we're very, very lucky to live here, very close to, to the beach. And we are also about a good hour from the mountains that we can go up to if in winter time, it will snow up there. So we don't actually get snow where we are but we can travel up there in winter time and see the snow as well. And then, as I say, good hour from, from the hustle bustle of the city. So I think it's, uh, I love, love living in the country. Um, yeah, we're on almost an acre of land. We've been here for 21 years now and we built this house. Um, my husband was actually used to be a concreter. He actually had a lot to do with the building of this house and we actually uh, planted all these trees that you see were planted by us very, very early on. So it's been lovely to see the trees maturing. Uh, and all the hard work that you see that you put into a garden is so wonderful to see 20 years on. Uh, it really brings me a lot of joy. And the name the Dahlia Society actually comes from my love of dahlias. I love growing dahlia tubers. I did speak in one of my Christmas vlogs about a condition I suffered um, in 2014 and that was called Bell's Palsy. It's when your facial nerves, uh, the paralysis sets in on one side and your face will completely drop. Um, and I've woken up thinking I'd had a stroke. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. Um, yeah, so we went to the emergency room and they actually said, look, it's, um, it's Bell's palsy. You have got a big risk of never regaining um, the muscle use in your face again. And the first sign that I had was when I woke up and I couldn't blink my eye and I couldn't lift the side of my mouth. And I just looked and I thought, something is terribly wrong. It was actually horrifying. We found out it was actually what the condition was. Um, it put a little bit of hope there, but I still had that fear of uh, never regaining muscle use in that side. So it took me about two or three months to get to about 80% of the, the use of the muscle. And then it gradually just got better and better. So I'm very, very lucky and very blessed to be able to smile again, blink my eye because yeah, of course you, when you can't blink your eye, you have to patch up your eye to sleep at night. It's actually really uncomfortable and you do suffer a lot of nerve pain and shooting pain. So Getting back to what I was talking about, um, now fully recovered, the garden was what helped me back then and the sewing. The sewing I found to be the best form of therapy ever because I actually got to zone out of all my problems and all the stress that I was dealing with with that. And the gardening, I think connecting with just the earth and getting your hands dirty and planting things, seeing things come to life was really a fantastic form of therapy for me. I love my garden, I love planting. I must admit my hubby does all the hard work here. He does the majority of the mowing. We do live, so we live in a beautiful spot here. We've got our border collie Meg, she's absolutely beautiful. Um, we've got four cats and yeah, we've got a very, very busy house um, while the girls are all still at uni. Um, they're all still living at home, but that won't be for much longer. I think they're all getting itchy feet and wanting to move out eventually, so it's, maybe one day I might get a sew it sneaky sewing room from one of their rooms but we'll see how we go with that. Next question is how long have I been sewing? Wow um, I did actually did a Q&A about my sewing history many many uh, months ago now I'll little link it if you want to hop on there and have a look at that but my sewing journey started I'd say when I was about 15. Um, I did a sewing class in at school uh, in year nine and didn't like it at all absolutely hated it because we were given these cranky old machines that wouldn't thread wouldn't sew very well um, the teacher was not enthusiastic at all she really didn't I don't think she wanted to be there whether she was a textiles teacher 
I don't really think she was. And that can then influence the joy that they, they might not have that joy for sewing. They're there just taking a class uh, they're not trained with. Um, yeah, she basically got us to sew a pencil case and that just, yeah, didn't, didn't inspire me at all. At that stage, I was working in a little department store after school, like on weekends and nights. It was called Treasure Way back, back in the 80s. And I must have seen a dress somewhere that I really liked. And back then, I think clothing was a lot more expensive. The fast fashion um, kind of hadn't taken over. It was quite quite pricey to go and buy a dress to wear out for an evening. Um, and I, I saw a nice, simple tank style dress and I wanted to replicate that. So I went and spoke to mum and of course she'd done a bit of sewing over the years. Like most mums back in the 60s and 70s would sew clothes for the kids because clothing was expensive, was hard to find if you wanted something in particular and yeah most people were taught sewing at school back in the 50s um yeah so clothing so i had to sew clothing i do remember her saying they were taught how to do things like ironing a shirt um making clothing was another thing and they learned smocking back then um and yeah more in depth kind of things like that and I, i'm really jealous about that because i would have loved to have learned a lot of that at school but we weren't given the opportunity but the school I was at, no, we didn't we didn't do that. So I actually asked mum and I said, can you help me sew a dress? So she gave me a little bit of a helping hand there, showed me how to read a pattern, how to cut it out and how to, how to stitch it. It was very, very basic. Um, but I think I made a little tie for the waist and I wore it to work one day and I got a few comments off customers. So I was actually given a lot of um, motivation then to keep sewing. I really enjoyed it. I think I made another dress and then of course as you do you leave to go and work full time and I think working in fashion for many years in clothing stores we had to wear the clothes that we sold so we weren't allowed to wear anything that wasn't in the store at the time so I just left the whole sewing thing behind and then I think when my first daughter was born I was 24 and I remember making things like a little quilt and bumpers for her cot because that also was very expensive to buy back then so it was kind of saving money, but also personalizing the little space. So I made a little mobile for her as well. And um, and then as the kids uh, went to things like dancing, I made costumes for them. And but it was on a very, very basic old uh, singer machine. Uh, yeah, so I didn't really start sewing my wardrobe till about 2014. That was about the same time as I was talking about with Bell's Palsy. It was a great hobby for me to dive into and uh, help me with the recovery process. So that was when I started venturing into making my own clothing. The next question is uh, machines. What machines have you got? Well, I actually started off on a really, really basic cheapy singer that um, was okay, but it wasn't brilliant. Uh, and then I uh, purchased my Janome, which I have now. That was uh, in 2014, 2015. And it's just a basic model Janome. It's uh, it's at the entry level, maybe one up from entry level, but it does a job. It's a fantastic machine. It's just like a bare bones machine. It's not computerized or anything, but it's a really lovely machine to sew on. And I was told by the lady that I actually bought it from that it was actually one of the machines I've had around since the 90s and they, they've still got it around because it is such a workhorse machine. Uh, the guys that, that actually serviced it for me last year, he's an elderly guy and he said, look, these machines are great. Hang on to them. Even if you update and upgrade one day, don't ever let go of these because they are really great machines to sew with. Um, I don't have a cover stitch. I don't have things like air threaders. I've got very basic machines and I've got an Aldi overlocker that's just about had its day. So maybe looking to upgrade that eventually. Um, I've also got a, um, a La Mer old vintage machine that was given to me by my husband's um, auntie, I think, a few years back. It's a 1950s kind of vintage style, beautiful to look at, but it needs a lot of work to get it up and running and sewing properly again. So it's something I'd like to look into in the future, maybe to get it sewing, uh, because those old machines are apparently lovely to work with too. Next question, okay. Self-taught or formal? Um, so I've talked a little bit about my mum gave me some basic instructions. Um, yeah, she, she hadn't sewn uh, a lot of technical side of things. She just knew some basics. Um, but I found that with the whole YouTube sewing community, I actually um, self-taught from watching a lot of those tutorials. But I also think that learning visually for me and seeing a video, seeing someone actually physically sewing something really is life-changing and it really helps. And living in a very small country community, we didn't have the luxury of things. I, don't, I didn't have the luxury of things like going to formal sewing classes around my area. Um, there's nothing offered around here like that so i really found that being online has taught me quite a lot and things like crafty as well have been great there are a lot of a lot of places now online that you can have those classes at home in your own time 
uh, when it suits you. And I just think that's great if you've got a young family as well. Uh, for me at the time, I wouldn't have had the choice having three under three uh, to go to classes and things like that would be. I think the online community of sewing has been brilliant for me. And yeah, I think it's just great to see something done in front of you and follow along. It's, it's awesome. This question is knits or wovens? Knits or wovens? Hmm. I like that question because that's like asking who is your favourite child. I love knits and I love wovens. I love sewing with both. I love the um, the different feel of the different fabrics, the way you know you can handle the fabric, the different techniques to use. I love swapping from when I've done a woven pattern to do a knit pattern next. Do you think there is a lot more choice in woven fabrics when you're shopping online, especially when you're shopping in store as well? Knits is not quite as big a range. The question is, okay, what do you do for a job? This is my job. I The, the channel at the moment, I'm putting 100% of my energy into making this my job. I'm very, very passionate about this channel, putting, investing all my time and energy into bringing you guys content. So I'm very lucky to be able to do that and to do what I love, that's sewing. And not only the sewing side of things, but inspiring you guys. I love, love doing this for a job. I'm very, very passionate about it. You know, my younger years, of course, I worked in retail, in clothing stores. I did some visual merchandising. I loved doing things like window dressing. Absolutely loved doing that. I think showing like a showcase how to complement different outfits together. I used to do it you on know, mannequins or on pin boards and things like that back in the 80s. Um, so I loved, loved doing that. And then, of course, went on to manage a couple of retail stores before my uh, eldest daughter was born. And when I got my oldest three off to school, I decided to do something I've been interested in for quite a long time, and that was massage therapy. I'd always, always wanted to learn it. I went and got my cert for certificate in massage therapy. I really, really enjoyed that. I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot for, about the human body, about anatomy. So I actually learned how to do sports massage, relaxation massage, and deep tissue massage. So yeah, it was hard work, very, very hard on the body, um, but I really enjoyed doing that. And then I went and had another baby and that kind of put a spatter in the works because I was doing a lot of it from a spare room in the house with friends and family. And I actually did it from a little natural therapy store in the main part of town that a lady let me hire part of her building out. She had things like crystals and tarot cards and essential oils, that kind of thing. And I used to do my massage therapy in there. Uh, yeah, so it was great having a space to do it because you do need a special space, uh, professional, space to do it in so it's I found it very very hard to do from home I didn't want to be having um, strangers coming to the home unless I knew them of course you really can't run a business like that you need to have a special space so when baby number four was born uh, yeah I sort of put that on hold for a while and then uh, baby number five we decided to have, and about six months later I actually fell over and broke my left wrist so that I found it very very hard with the massaging and putting things like the pressure of course if you know if you've ever had a massage before you'll know that they use a lot of rotator um, and wrist and, and hand work of course you're putting a lot of pressure there and that unfortunately with the with the break it didn't uh didn't take too well so i really had to put that on hold and just do it for people uh, in the family and friends when i got time and um look i i loved doing the massage therapy I must say I, I didn't ever make a lot of money out of doing it, but I found the joy and the, the human connection and touch was a very, very rewarding thing, uh, especially when um, we lost my dad three years ago to prostate cancer and he would come every second day and the massage really helped relax him and he found that form of therapy very, very helpful. And it was a way for me to kind of give back to him uh, before he died to really connect with him and I just I feel very very lucky that I was able to to help him through pain at that time of his life and yeah if anything it was very worthwhile doing the course just to help dad uh, at the end there and um, yeah help soothe his pain. My mum actually lives just up the road from me a couple hundred meters away so we are very close um, so it was really really hard when we lost dad because we um, you know we saw each other every day um, yeah so and she's got the sewing bug too now which is fantastic so she'll quite often say hey come and have a look at this one I've made and yeah, it's, it's a really great bonding thing if uh, you've got mother and daughter teams sewing together also love the fact that my eldest daughter Phoebe's doing a textiles diploma and loves that she's doing a bachelor next year and her sewing bug is literally well and truly taken off so it's so nice to have that bond between mother and daughter to do things like your fabric shopping and getting inspiration from each other. So I feel very, very lucky to have that as part of my life to sort of connect all of us together. Next question is big four or indie patterns? 
Well, I started on big four patterns, uh, but I really found it very, very hard because not only was I not really taught a lot of the terminology, I had to do a lot of Googling. Um, I found that things like fitting was very, very hard. I couldn't fit into one straight size range and that really baffled me. Because working in clothing, you get to know what size you are, what size fits most bodies, um, and you get that in your mind. So when you're looking at a, say, a size 14 on a ready to wear, a, say, a size 14 on a big four, so that really threw me, but I got used to the fact that I was going to have to do a lot of grading. I would never fit into one straight size. Now, a lot of those size ranges have been around forever and a day. They're very, very antiquated uh, sizing system. When you see things like the hip to waist and bust ratio, you just think, wow, who who can fit into those sizes? I don't, personally don't know anyone that fits into many of those sizes. But the thing I've been taught to look for would be look at the finished garment measurements on a uh, big four pattern to learn to sew your size and get that size right and look at your upper bust measurements. So I had a lot of issues and a, a lot of disasters and things that I'd had patterns that looked great and I'd made them up and they looked terrible. Um, so when Indie Patterns first came on the scene, there was only a few patent companies around. It was life changing for me because not only were they more modern looking patterns, the models that they used as well, I found were more realistic. Their sizing was incredible because I could not make a straight size 14 or 12 or whatever it might have been and I would fit into it. I had, didn't have to do any adjustments or any, um, yeah, I think the first patterns I started off with uh, would be things like Christine Haynes, the Emery dress, um, Colette patterns back then, it was the Manita dress. And Tilling the Buttons, I think I started, it was, I was making a lot of vintage style clothing back then. So they were the main patterns that I was making and I just thought they were amazing because they had perfect instructions. You'd get little books that were handwritten, like little, basically little books to, with illustrations. They were amazing. They were just so much better than anything I'd ever seen. So for a beginner sewist, I think any patterns are the way to go because not only do you get a great fit, great drafting, but you also get those beautiful little instruction booklets. Uh, and then I got into the whole world of PDF patterns and I just thought, wow, this is also amazing because not only can I find a great pattern online that I can get from anywhere in the world, I can download it instantly. If I wanted to make a pattern at midnight, I could download that pattern, print it out. And once you get your head around the whole putting together the PDF, uh, it really isn't that hard to do at all. And then you find the whole world of the A0 printing, which is also amazing. So really, I think Indie is the way to go. And I also say that because my, as I said, my daughter learned to sew. She picked a simplicity jacket for herself last year. Wow, it was so hard for her to read as a newbie sewer. So I really had to do a bit of head scratching myself and pick that pattern apart with her to get it, um, to get it fitting. In the end, she did a great job on it. But the next pattern she sewed up was a Pattern Emporium pattern. And of course, fantastic instructions and illustrations. And it's basically set out in front of you there. You really can't set a foot wrong if you read every instruction that is. And of course she just said, wow, this is just like day and night, the difference. So she said, look, definitely indie patterns for her for a newbie is the way to go. So I'm an indie girl all the way. So I think a lot of people that run these indie patent companies are female led businesses that are so invested in uh, wanting to bring out great patterns for their customers. They really are very good at what they do and I just think a lot of time and effort goes into building those companies up. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, your people at your big four patterns, which is, if you don't know, it's things like McCall's uh, Vogue Simplicity patterns. They are all owned under one big umbrella. And as far as I've learned, they are actually owned by a card, a gift card company that has basically owns them all. So I don't know whether they are as invested in the patterns for the consumer. It's interesting to get different takes on it. But I do know there are a lot of um, designers that will um, help design the big four patterns as well that uh, I think it's fantastic because they get more of those people on board. This question, okay, online or in store? Well, if you had have asked me this question 18 months ago, I would have said definitely in store, but that was before COVID. Before we were shut down for a good eight, nine months. Without having that lockdown, I would never have found so many amazing online stores that are not physical stores these are just online stores that you can actually order from and I've found the service to be just incredible. You can get swatch cards, you get personalised service. They put things like little tea bags in your delivery, little handwritten cards and you do be made to feel very, very special and rewarded for shopping with them. So I think when you get to know those um, fabric companies, fabric shops that are a lot of them are uh, female owned and led as well. And that these ladies are very, very passionate about their little fabric stores. They will go to the ends of the earth to help you 
find something special. For me to, to go shopping, it, you know, it's a good day out. A, it'd be a whole day out, it'd be a whole day of traveling backwards and forwards. So you've got an hour and a half drive in there, an hour and a half back. Uh, it's just not something I can do at the drop of a hat. Uh, my nearest spotlight is a good 30 minute drive away. So it's not just around the corner. I don't have any uh, haberdashery shops nearby. So I do rely on online stores. But a lot of new stores I've found online just this past six months, I think you're gonna really love as well. For me, it's practicality of being online, being living in a, a very small country town, a long way away from the city. A lot of us here in Australia, we probably don't have that variety of physical stores like a lot of you would in the US and the UK. Definitely take advantage of things like swatch cards because you can get to touch and feel the fabric as well. It's a great way to, to look at before you buy. Next question is favorite sewing task. Fabric shopping? Is that, is that a task? I do love matching up fabrics to patterns. I could do that all day, every day. It's one of my favorite, favorite things to do. It's not essentially a sewing task, but it's part of the process. I love, love the different possibilities and ways I can change the look of a garment, the different patterns to different fabrics. You can totally change the look. Um, so that's a very, very favorite part of the process for me. I do love when I set up the sewing machine, I have a cup of tea, YouTubers on there, ready to run and I'll start sewing. That whole process of just being in the moment is fantastic. It's my favorite thing ever. And just starting to sew, I think is great. When you attach those shoulder seams together, it starts coming together, it's, uh, it's a really, really rewarding process. So I would say all of it, I don't have a favorite task. Um, I've got a lot of not favorite tasks, but, I love, I love the whole thing. I love sewing. Uh, I love just, yeah, the whole process. Best sewing advice? I would say start. If you are one of those people that watch for a long time, watch the watch sewing blogs and you are always wanting to try it, but then you back out and think, no, I can't, I don't know enough, I'm not good enough. You need to start because it will change your life. You will never have to rely on fast fashion searching for something that you've got in your mind you want say a red woolen coat and you can't find one well you can actually learn to sew it I have a lot of people contact me and say well your wardrobe must be overflowing and i'll say yeah, literally it is busting it is overflowing i need to go through it but i don't think there should be a guilt a guilty feeling for that because i think like anyone that makes or creates art makes where we make wearable art um, maybe people paint they might paint canvases they may may do you know many many canvases and you know some of them will be great some won't they don't hang every canvas on their wall but they they are proud of their work and they will keep their work uh, but it's like sewing you may not wear every single thing that you've made but it's there and a part of the process has been the sewing and that whole feeling of satisfaction of making your own garments there is nothing like it it is a really really great feeling and you feel very accomplished when you can say to someone that you've made it yourself and you really, really feel proud of yourself. So I would say my sewing advice is really just be fearless. Uh, pick, pick the bright bulb patterns that you think you're not game enough to wear that you'd love to be able to, do it. Um, choose the garment that you think won't suit you, but you really, really love it. You need to sew, they're, they're the things that you need to sew because you need to be able to show yourself that you really can make and wear anything that you choose to. So there are no rules in sewing. There are no sizes. You don't have to put a little label on your garments so people can see what size you made. Size is essentially your size. So you could be a combination of different sizes. So yeah, it, it's, it's very, very empowering and it really does change the way you look at your body, changes, yeah, it changes your body image altogether. I think it's fantastic for a lot of people in the community that have had trouble searching for things to fit them for many, many years. Uh, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of young people out there that find that they don't fit into a lot of the smaller size garments uh, that are really a lot of stores will only cater for maybe you know size eight to size fourteen or largest and that's really really disappointing to my age and, and older a lot of us you know a lot of people heading towards fifty and over fifty are also forgotten about in the uh, fashion world a lot of the time things things aren't catered maybe to what you know things that we want to wear. I know that's why I started sewing because I really couldn't find anything uh, in my size that I wanted to wear at that time. Interesting colors and prints and patterns. So I thought, you know, sewing has got to be the way to go because it can really open up so many doors for you to put your personality into your clothing that you wouldn't necessarily find from ready to wear clothing. Thanks to Jen for that wonderful hashtag. That was really, really fun. And I know that you guys are going to enjoy going and looking at all the other hashtags. So that's Get To Know Friday Sews. I will put that hashtag below and you can go and see what everyone else is up to today. It's a really, really fun way 
to see, to get a little bit of background history from your favorite sewists online. Don't forget, if you haven't already followed me over on Instagram, I do have Dahlia Society Instagram. I'll link that below and also a Facebook page for Dahlia Society too, if you're interested in joining that. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up. I would really appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed, you know the drill, just hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on any future episodes. Take care, happy sewing, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now.